The illustration on this title page for this slideshow is from a French epic poem from the late 1100s called the Roman de Brut, the Romance of Brutus. It was a French epic poem about the history of Britain. It includes the first mention of the Round Table. It is not, a, it is not the first in, uh, mention of King Arthur and his knights. The first solid um, version of that is from Geoffrey of Monmouth, who uh, a Welsh um, Norman churchman who worked in Oxford and wrote a book called The History of the Kings of Britain in the early 1100s. And this text is where the stories of King Lear and Arthur uh, come from. And he's not generally considered very reliable as a historian, but he's a pretty great storyteller. And anyway, I include all this um, to let you know that also uh, Wace was translated into, out of French, into um, Middle English by a guy named Leamon, which means a lawman. And this is one of the earliest long works of Middle English literature that we have. And it's written in the alliterative style that comes from uh, old, um, old English poetry. And so I, I give you this example to tell you about the complex linguistic situation of triglossia that existed in the Middle English period. There were three languages, French, English, and Latin, namely Old French, Middle English, uh, and medieval Latin that interacted with each other and served were used for different purposes and in different uh, domains by different people. There are many ways in which this multilingual situation in, in medieval uh, England um, uh, less, had a lasting effect on our language. For example, in names, uh, we have a number of Anglo-Saxon names that come from Anglo-Saxon sources, such as Alfred, Edward, Wilfred, Hilda, Audrey, Ashley, and Ethel. Now, some of these are more common than others, but we also have a number of names that are some more common than others as well that come from Norman. William, Robert, Richard, Baldrick, Adeline, Eleanor, and Marjorie. Now, interestingly, even though Norman is a, f a dialect of French, a lot of these are Germanic names because the Normans themselves were originally Ger um, Ger German-speaking people and they brought their names with them. Not all of them, but like Ricard, for example, Richard, would have been um, hard rule or firm ruler or something like that. Um, again, related to that rich in bishopric or reich in modern German. Um, now, an interest, the thing is, we can kind of identify that the, the role that French-speaking people played in the Middle Ages by where many of their words come from. Um, there are words that belong to the domain of government, Court, crown, duke, empire, minister, parliament, sir, tax. Um, of course, these are words that belong to the medieval government more than our modern uh, republic. Um, religion, baptism, cardinal, cathedral, convent, prayer, religion, and virgin. Now, of course, many of these, uh, so, some religious words, as we talked about, have come in from Latin through Old English, but now they come in filtered through the French language as well. Words for the military, large number of words for the military, arms, army, battle, captain, defend, enemy, sergeant, and soldier are all words that English got from Norman French in the Middle Ages. Now, why is this? This is because in the Middle Ages, it was the ruling class who fought, who had um, access to weaponry such as knights and uh, such as armor and horses and steel and weapons. Um, generally, the peasantry they might they might be uh, levied for a for a large battle and and go in carrying a spear or a pitchfork or something like that. But generally, armies were um, staffed and oh, staffed is kind of anachronistic, but they were made up by um, the ruling class to be a knight. Uh, was to be nobly, to be, to be born at least into the gentry. Um, it took the, pe the labor of about 300 peasants to support one knight with all his uh, metal equipment and not just one horse, but several horses because you needed to keep a fresh horse in battle. Um, the medieval uh, the Mid Middle Ages saw society itself as being um, divided into three estates, right? There was the uh, church, there was the nobility, and there were the peasants, there were the commoners, and, and they understood these as those who prayed, 
those who fought and those who worked. And the ruling class were believed to have the responsibility to defend the powerless against the powerful and to defend Christendom. And so they tried to Christianize the kind of old Germanic warrior culture. And this is one of the interesting stories about the Middle Ages. And if you've taken 340 with me or are going to, you'll, you'll hear about it more. Um, education, anatomy, geometry, grammar, medicine, noun, square. The, uh, these are all uh, square. We're talking about a mathematical tool. All of these are um, words that come from French, many from Latin originally, but that are filtered through through French into English. Um, we also, besides elites sort of running uh, the institutions of government, the military, religion, and schools, the elites, of course, have the most money, and so they are they are the biggest cons uh, consumers of trade goods and crafts. And so many of our words for fashion and furnishings, including the words fashion and furnishings, come from French. Boots, button, coat, collar, dress, robe, mantle, wardrobe, all um, French uh, roots. Now, wardrobe here, this is an interesting one because this is a compound word, right? Robe is a word that means dress or clothing or robe, right? And ward... Remember in um, Hlafwearda, uh, loaf ward or bread, bread keeper? This is a root that uh, is found in Old English as well. And that's because some French words actually do have Germanic in them. French is mostly Romance in its vocabulary, but there is a influence... Uh, there is a um, level of words, mostly in many involving farming and military, uh, from Frankish, which was a Germanic language itself. Their um, precious stones come from French. Amethyst, diamond, emerald, pearl, ruby, sapphire, jewel. Leisure and the arts, the word art itself. Chess, dance, literature, melody, music, sorry about the typo there. Uh, paint, all of these are French words and the home, blanket, cellar, ceiling, cellar, curtain, cushion, and towel. Now, what happens now then, um, if we have two pe uh, people speaking two languages at the same time in the same place, and then those languages get squashed together, is that we end up with doublets. We end up with words that are um, both Germanic and uh, we, we get the different words for the same thing. So for example, we have this good old fashioned Anglo-Saxon word, help, help. Um, and then the romance, aid or assist, right? In, in from Old English, we have begin or start. In the romance, commence, hide, conceal, hardy, cordial. Now, maybe you're beginning to sense that we don't use words in the same way, and maybe there's a systematic difference between how we use Germanic words and how we use Romance words. A, a hearty welcome is not quite the same thing as a cordial welcome, is it? And if you're drowning, you're not going to say, aid me, assist me. You're going to say, help, help. Um, although, it, interestingly, the, the mayday, uh, like they say on ships or planes, mayday, mayday, that comes from French. It literally means help me. It's a compound of M apostrophe, aidez-moi. It's like aide-moi, mayday. Um, but yeah, to be, these have all kinds of kind of a more um, ceremonial, highbrow feeling to them. Um, I, but of course, French also is the language of of sort of romance and the new chivalric courtly culture that would transform relations between the sexes in the medieval period and afterwards. And so, a wish for something is maybe different than desire, even though they come from they mean the same thing. Meet encounter. Brotherly, fraternal. And again, there's there's a kind of home versus public feeling to some of these words. Child, infant. The, these, we don't, we, there was no infant word, and, and infant comes from a Latin word literally that means unspeaking, with, with the fa root being the same as that in forum, a place where people spoke. Freedom, liberty, which, again, they mean the same thing, but they, they're used in different kinds of contexts. They have different connotations. They have a different sort of texture and emotional flavor to them. Um, and and, this, and we're, in, in another video, we'll talk about what happens when we get triplets, because we get a word that is 
first borrowed into English from French, and then another word that is borrowed into English from Latin. And so we have three different senses, three different kinds of words. Uh, and of course, there's another, a good example of this is wedding and marriage, right? Wedding is the Old English, marriage is the French, and then from from Latin we'll get nuptial, right? Which which so uh, that which is a whole other kind of domain, an intellectual sort of uh, um, feel to it. So let's focus on the domain of law. Let's focus in on how, just how much English language um, in law comes from uh, French. And I use the word domain um, in its sociolinguistic sense as a, um, an area of experience or practice. Um, and we can talk about a discourse domain and the domain of a particular, or the discourse of a particular domain, right? These are all belong to the discourse domain of focus. And, and by discourse, I mean language in use, um, not just sort of the theoretical system of the grammar and the list of words that you can possibly say, but, but language as it ends up getting used. So in law, we have legal roles such as advocate, attorney, bailiff, coroner, defendant, judge, jury, and plaintiff. Actions, processes, and institutions, bail, bill, decree, evidence, fine, forfeit, jail, inquest, penalty, petition, plea, proof, punishment, ransom, sentence, suit, summons, verdict, the names of crimes, arson, assault, embezzlement, felony, fraud, larceny, libel, perjury, slander, treason, trespass. Um, uh, so much, a great, massive amount of the vocabulary of our common law system in America and in the Commonwealth all comes from medieval French, from the old French uh, legacy, because the law courts were run in French, they were administered by French-speaking people, and French became the, remained the language of uh, legal proceedings in England, and even after most, even of the ruling class, uh, people in England spoke English as their first language and had to learn French as a second language. And it's only, I think, in the 1400s that English, or in, in, in 1350 or so, I forget the exact year, that it's probably in one of your readings, that one can give te even give testimony in a court in England in English. And it's only in the 1400s that parliamentary records and legal records are written in English at all. Now, another little quirk of, of the French legacy in, in our legal system is that French word order, um, noun adjective, is preserved, right? In French, you say le cheval noir, the, ho the horse black, instead of le noir cheval, the, the black horse, for the most part. There's a few exceptions, but generally in French and other Romance languages, you say the noun and then the adjective, you know, the, the horse big, the house white. La Maison Blanche, right? Um, so the French word order is preserved as in attorney general. This is why the plural of attorney general is not attorney generals. It's attorneys general because general is the adjective and, attorney, and attorney is the noun. And we don't pluralize adjectives in English. Court martial, fee simple, heir apparent, letters patent. These are all um, places where law has preserved the practice of saying a... Um, putting the noun and then the adjective. We also have, um, of course, a famous example of, of the, the du of doublets uh, is the words um, for, for an animal in the field versus the animal on my plate, right? And the, the animal on the plate is almost always taken from uh, French. Um, so the calf becomes veal, deer becomes venison, ox becomes beef. A sheep becomes met mutton, and a pig becomes pork. Now, it's, it's a famous sort of like folk etymology, which goes back to, in, among other things, Walter Scott's great medievalist novel, Ivanhoe, that speculates that this was because the, um, the, the French ruling class did not interact with the animals except to eat them, um, whereas, except maybe for horses, uh, um, Whereas the if you were the, the working peasant Saxon, then you you continued to deal with the animal as um, a farm uh, animal and not just as a, a dish. Now, um, people have taken issue with this, and some say that it has more to do with the fact that uh, f uh, French culture and French cuisine was enormously 
um, prestigious and influential in the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries. And so uh, when when sh fancy cookery and cuisine became a thing, like, there's the word cuisine right there, it's some good French for you, and it's not the French, it's not kitchen, it's cuisine. But when we French cuisine started to being adopted by the upper classes, they took the French names for things as well. I'm, I don't have enough expertise to settle this issue, but there's a debate for you. Um, Another important thing to remember about the influence of French on English is that it really comes in two waves. And the first is the Anglo-Norman, and that's, um, we first get sort of Anglo-Norman words and charters and things just from basic context starting in 900, but really accelerating after 1066, obviously, um, up to 1250. Uh, the, the Normans and the Anglo-Saxons were already intermarrying, uh, the, the ruling families by 900. So this is the period, um, this earlier period, most of the French loan words come from a specific dialect of Old French, just as we saw that there were dialects of Old English, there are dialects of Old French, and the Normans conquer, and they it's their dialect that they bring with them. But then... Um, we borrow another 10,000 words from French after 1250 to the end of the Middle English period. And at that point, we're mostly borrowing words not from Anglo-Norman, which is considered like, pardon my phrasing here, but by 1250, it's considered kind of hick French. The, the power of the French monarchy and of Paris has grown immensely during this time. Um, and so when the and the Normans back in Normandy are their French is becoming more and more like that of Central French, of Parisian French, and so the the Anglo the Anglo Norman aristocracy wants to speak the right kind of French, not this kind of like old fashioned weird provincial French that they that their grandfathers and grandmothers spoke when they came to England. They want to speak the new kind of like you know fancy good French. And that's Central French. That's the French that became what is now standard Parisian international French. And so we end up with a number of uh, doublets just from two different kinds of French in modern English. So the word castle and chateau, both coming from the Roman word castrum, like an encampment, um, show a difference between uh, the, the Anglo-Norman and the Central French. The hard C is the Anglo-Norman, and the ch is the Central French. So like we have cat and chat. That cha is French for cat. That shows that distinction. Cattle versus chattel. Now, chattel um, is property in modern English, right? And it goes back to a time when the most important property you had was your cattle. A uh, wicket um, uh, is either the thing you have to knock over in cricket, or it's what they call like a teller window, like the DMV or a bank in, in the Commonwealth. Um, the, French, the central French version, version of this is guichet, and you can see the difference between w and the g sounds is also characteristic of this difference. Uh, guichet is really only um, uh, English in, in Quebec, actually, uh, for, for uh, an automatic teller machine. Um, you know, man, i got to hit up the guichet before we head to the dip on her. It's, it's a little weird there. Um, gauge versus wager or wage is another example of these words. It was a token or a, uh, of, of, for, or a collateral that was given in return for a loan or as a pledge. And it was literally referred to a glove originally. Guard versus warden. Um, shows that that uh, distinction. I, th I think I've reversed them. And warden was the Anglo-Norman, and guard and uh, wager was the um, Anglo-Norman, and gauge and guard was the Central French. Real versus royal. Um, these are just two different ways of saying the same thing. Legal versus loyal, with, with the royal being the, um, the Anglo-Norman, I believe, and the legal being uh, the Central French. Anyway, um, so, th so there's, there's another a number of examples of, of these kinds of doublets. Now, here's the thing. People are still speaking English, and they will continue to speak English, even as that, if, as that English borrows more and more words from French. So what stays Old English? Well, the, the 100 most commonly used words in the English language are still have Anglo-Saxon etymology. And so words that refer to everyday experience. Eat, drink, sleep, work, play, speak, sing, walk, run, ride, leap, swim. All these verbs are Old English. Um, 
We talked about how the uh, French speakers were the customers for luxury goods, but many room, many houses and homes aren't luxury houses, and so words like house, hall, bower, which is an old word for bedroom, room, window, door, floor, step, gate, all of these come from Old English. Uh, and even while we eat our, our mutton and our beef and our veal, we, the, we still have all these words, meat, drink, bread, butter, fish, milk, cheese, salt, pepper, wine, ale, and beer are all from Old English. Now, I have cheese and wine uh, in italics here just to remind myself to tell you that these were actually words that were borrowed directly from Latin um, by... Old English, or possibly the, the Germanic language that Old English was the ancestor from. Uh, wine, of course, being a luxury good that, became, that came from the Mediterranean and that the Germanic peoples would not have encountered until they traded with the Romans. And in fact, in fact the word grape in English is a borrowing from French. Uh, the, the, a grape was actually referred to a grappa, which is a hook that you cut off the uh, grapes with when you were harvesting them. In Old English, the word for a grape was a weenberry, a wineberry. Isn't that cute? All right, what else stays Old English? Arms, legs, feet, hands, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, shoulders, head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. All of these things are Old English. So we, you can see the kind of different discourse domains and realms of experience that uh, were now divided into separate lexicons that all kind of blended together and formed the the, the magnificent bastard language, as MacWhorter calls it, of old of Middle English.